the people to find out the kind of gaps and skills that exist. And I think this is, again, a very, very big uh, national initiative which is taking place. And we appreciate you through that. So, Sandeep. Uh, good morning, and thank you for being here. Requirements. 
according to international labor organization estimates in india the difficulty to fill up jobs is 48% which is far higher than the international average and this in our experience is particularly difficult for small and medium firms to meet a large firm can afford to create a captive skill institute it can afford to institute training programs to make sure that the skilled labor is available to them but for smaller and medium scale enterprises it becomes very difficult to find skilled labor it's not feasible for them even to conduct recruiting at large uh, itis or other such institutes because they have a very small requirement another major problem that characterizes the skill gap in india is that about 3/4 of employment is unorganized that means these uh, companies or firms are not registered anywhere so the people who work here again are informally skilled or they are skilled on the job we don't really know how information channels work how skilling processes work in the unorganized sector and that's one major skill gap it's a black box that many players and many stakeholders are really trying actively to understand <coughs> on the supply side there are constraints there is a reason why this skill gap is not automatically being met by market factors on one side there is a student perception of skill development that is negative traditionally there has been a very strong preference for formal education because that's associated with white collar jobs and more dignified employment skill development until very recently was seen as a last resort when people <coughs> could not make it in the formal education sector then perhaps they would opt for vocational education and <coughs> other other problems include placements we have skill development institutes and there are lots of private initiatives that are coming up but there isn't a clear linkage between vocational training and employment and in the absence of that linkage it does not make sense for a student to invest in vocational training and there is an opportunity cost to skilling when we say that 75% of total employment is in the unorganized sector this indicates that for somebody to go and get formally skilled they would otherwise otherwise be informally skilled they would work with somebody in the unorganized sector and on the job they would pick up the skills and they would learn now for a person who is working in the unorganized sector to leave this job and to go and get himself formally skilled even if that training program itself does not cost much there is an opportunity cost involved in losing that job and in losing wages for that period of training which again acts as a disincentive to skill development <coughs> Uh, the distribution of capacity if we see across states is very uneven of course this is uh, this depends on a number of regional characteristics government proactive this nature of industry in each of these areas largely in the eastern states we see that per capita supply of skill development institutes is very low the southern states have performed relatively <coughs> well particularly tamil nadu and andhra and karnataka as have states like himachal pradesh and punjab However there are qualitative skill gaps here that cannot be quantified in this map. There are people who have formal skill training but are still unable to perform the jobs that they should be able to perform. And this is a major problem for industry because then the skill that they required, the certificate that they required is not an effective signal of their actual capability. So just to sum up the section there is a huge skill gap there is a shortage of skill labor in india and this is an impediment to inclusive economic growth it, in the short term it affects productivity it's very difficult for firms to operate without skill labor and this fall in labor productivity has to be sustained and it affects economic growth in the short run but from our primary research what we the impression that we gathered was that in the long run if skill labor continues to be unavailable there will be technology substitution if there aren't laborers to perform the job they will just machine they'll automate the processes and in a country like india where we have a huge labor force if processes get automated particularly in traditionally labor intensive sectors such as textiles and leather it makes inclusive growth a more of a challenge it becomes very difficult to generate employment that causes problems in different dimensions for the economy and the percentage of the workforce in india that's currently re receiving formal skill training is estimated to be about 10% which is extremely low compared to other developing nations like 
like you where there's about 70% of the workforce being trained. This unskilled workforce pro provides a huge potential for the economy. Those who remain unskilled are either unemployed for want of appropriate employment opportunities, or they find employment and they become informally skilled, or they undertake menial jobs. And that sort of puts them in a poverty trap. So by skilling them, we are essentially offering mobility to labor. We are offering them a chance to go from the jobs that they have to performing higher productivity jobs, to contributing more effectively, to aspiring to a better standard of living than the one that they currently have. And this skill gap, uh, this wage gap across different skill levels is established. There's a huge wage gap across skill levels in India. Uh, because of all these problems, because it has been identified that this skill gap will hurt the Indian economy in the long run, skill development has been identified as a national priority. Over the next 10 years, the Indian government plans to focus on skill in a big way. And a three-tier system was set up to bridge this skill gap. The government has set an ambitious target of skilling 500 million people by 2022. In order to do this, there's a three-tier system that works. The first tier is the Prime Minister's Skill Development uh, Council. This council sets objectives for skill development for the country. It lays down broad objectives. It coordinates public and private sector initiatives in the skill development space. And it reviews the progress of schemes that have been implemented in skill development. The PM Skill Council consists of ministers of finance, of human resource development, of the chairman of the NSDC, and other large people who work at the highest policy levels to set objectives. <coughs> the next tier is the National Skill Development Coordination Board. This board is constituted by secretaries of these ministries. We have the secretary in the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Human Resource Development, uh, Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, and so on. And what the Skill Development Board is supposed to do is create strategies to meet those objectives that have been set by the PM Skill Council. The Skill Development Board performs the function of addressing regional imbalances in skill infrastructure, establishing an inventory of skills across the country, since this information is not readily available. So even identifying the skill gap becomes very difficult when we look at it at a more granular level. And the Skill Development Coordination Board has the responsibility of monitoring and evaluating different schemes that are set up in this sector. The third body that we will be focusing on is the National Skill Development Corporation. The National Skill Development Corporation coordinates and stimulates private sector investment in the sector, in the skill development sector. So essentially, the NSDC was set up as a public-private partnership with the intent of catalyzing private investment in the skill development sector. The idea was to facilitate greater involvement of private players in an organized way. So if we look at the structure of the NSDC, we have 49% investment by the Department of Economic Affairs, which comes under the Ministry of Finance, and 51% investment by industry bodies, including the Confederation of Indian Industries, Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industries, and so on. Under this public-private partnership, they formed the National Skill Development Corporation in 2009. The NSDC manages the National Skill Development Fund, which is a 100% government-owned trust, in return for a management fee. Using this fund, the NSDC is able to catalyze private investment by providing financial support to these private initiatives. They provide support in the form of loans, soft loans at subsidized rates with repayment moratorium, in the form of equity infusion, and in very rare cases in the form of a grant. So far, the, the NSDC in funding different investments, the NSDC's responsibility is to scale 150 million people by 2022. Of the 500 million target that the government has set, 150 is supposed to be met by the private sector with facilitation from the NSDC. And so far, the, the NSDC has scaled about 280,000 people. The funding criteria that the NSDC uses, proposals can be submitted by private players to the NSDC, which are evaluated through a stringent procedure to decide whether funds should be made available to that particular institute. 
the funding criteria focus to a great extent on the sustainability and the scalability of the model. A model is not funded unless a minimum of 100,000 people will be trained in, the, in over a period of 10 years. And the NSDC funds up to 75% of the initiative. At least 25% of the capital has to come from the private player. And the capital that is taken from the NSDC cannot be used for infrastructure. It has to be used for skill development for the core function that the institute performs. For, uh, in, in terms of infrastructure, there is an overt focus on using existing capacity, on using existing buildings, existing capacity for infrastructure. There's also a big push in terms of technology and innovation because outreach is a problem. There are many remote areas that require skill development and without technology, it's very expensive to reach these areas. And finally, of course, partnerships with prospective employers, with state governments and other stakeholders are encouraged so that the private skill institute has an ecosystem within which it functions. And it has clear linkages and partnerships with all the players in this ecosystem. It has, uh, the NSDC focuses on skilling across sectors, but it has 21 sectors which have been identified by the planning commission as priority sectors. And its sector-wise skilling target is also defined in terms of these priority sectors, such as organized retail, IT, construction, <coughs> automobile, and so on. Another mandate of the NSDC is to set up sector skill councils. The idea of a sector skill council is to shift the onus of skill development, the responsibility of skill development on the industry. One of the major problems that the Indian skill development sector is facing right now is the relevance of the curriculum. There is capacity. There is a huge amount of government capacity that is being created for skill development. But a lot of this is not utilized or it's redundant in a way because the skills that are imparted are not relevant to the industry. Often the equipment is outdated or the curriculum is outdated. So a person who gets skilled in an industrial training institute will often be treated at par with somebody who is just completed school. So they're not treated as somebody who has done something over and above that. They don't get a premium for acquiring those skills. Because the skills that they've acquired are not useful to the industry. They're not relevant at all. So by setting up a sector skill council, a sector skill council is essentially a body that is formed by the industry in order to conduct research for skilling across the value chain of that particular industry to look at delivery mechanisms and identify the most appropriate delivery mechanisms for that industry and to ensure that there's quality assurance because accreditation me mechanisms are not have not been put in place currently. So the Sector Skill Council performs a, a nodal role in, in for skilling in that particular sector. It takes care of accreditation, it makes sure that curricul curricula are relevant, it makes sure that there is adequate research and data available on where the skill gaps are present in that particular industry. And so far, the NSDC has set up 18 sector skill councils, and four more sector skill councils are, the proposals are under evaluation, and eight more proposals are in the pipeline. So with the creation of the NSDC, several modes of funding have been adopted. We have, across the spectrum, we have initiatives that are fully funded by the government, such as the Industrial Training Institute. And we have initiatives that are fully funded by the private sector, such as most private skill training institutes that are not uh, availing of funds from the NSDC. But in the PPP space, there has been an exploration of a number of different models to set up skill development institutes. So in this section, we'll just briefly look at some of the models that NSDC partners, as well as other skill training institutes, have adopted to provide skills in this particular space. So, so these are, the first two are NSDC partners. Be Able stands for Basics Academy for Building uh, Long-Term employ Employability. Gram Tarang is another organization that was funded by the NSDC. We have two organizations that are NSDC partners and we have two organizations that are privately funded, that uh, obtain funds through private equity or other sources. Now, what we see is that each of these focus on a very different sector. Be Able focuses on the farm sector and construction sector because their focus is on livelihood. 
Gram Tarang is about building relevance, about catering to industry requirements. So they use a model which is very demand driven and it's not supply driven. Vita is the largest English uh, skill training provider in India. At present they have centers, they have about 240 centers across the country. And what they do is that they, uh, they've used a franchise model to expand. It's a pretty old, uh, it's a pretty well established initiative. It was set up in 1981. And they've used private equity and their focus is English and personality development and other soft skills. Merit Track is another innovative model that has seen huge success in India. What they saw was that there was a market gap for assessment. Because the skill training is not providing a clear signal of student quality, they offer to assess students who want to work in a particular sector and they administer a standardized test. So industries, universities, skill training institutes come to Merit Track and they ask them to certify their students so that they can know exactly what the skill attainment of that student is. So if we look at these four models, all four very different models, we can see that an industry institute linkage is what makes or breaks that institute. Because without placements, the students will not see any point in, it, in enrolling for skill training. And since all models in India tend to be volume driven since they have to focus on a high volume and low margin gain given that the willingness to pay on the part of the students is relatively low. We see that in order to make such a model sustainable, to have a model where you're keeping your margins low, the only way that sustainability can be built into such a model is to leverage the use of ICT. By using greater technology, they're able to adopt, uh, by using uh, ICT on a large scale, they're able to keep their costs down. We've also seen a great deal of interest in this sector from private players, from international <coughs> players. There are countries that are looking to collaborate with India in this space. Germany, Australia, UK and Singapore have all expressed interest in working with India in the skill development space. And in our interactions, we see that there is a definite belief in the long-term sustainability of the skill development sector in India. To look at opportunities for, player, for international players in this particular market, given the context as I've said so far, there is a clear business case for skill development in India, especially after the setting up of the NSDC and the consequent attention that skill development has received. In terms of entry barriers, the market is not very highly regulated. There are government skill training institutes such as industrial training institutes and industri industrial training centers. These institutes are set up by the Department of Employment and Training of that particular state. But private skill training institutes are largely unregulated in the Indian market. 100% FDI is permitted in skill development and unlike education, it can be a for-profit venture in India. But this lack of regulation is both a challenge and an opportunity. It's an opportunity in the sense that it's easy for a new player to set up base, but it's a problem because a student cannot distinguish between a good training institute and a bad training institute. Any person can come and set up an institute. But over time, we're expecting this regulation to become more structured since we have sector skill councils, since we have state level skill development missions that are being set up to focus exclusively on these issues. In terms of competition, a large proportion of the skill training market is dominated by the government in India. So this essentially causes a sort of excess supply situation because the government training schemes are highly subsidized. They provide courses at very low rates. And despite this, we can see that there is an interest from private players in spite of this uh, supply of training institutes by the government, there are private players who are able to see that there is a qualitative skill gap, that there is a quantitative skill gap that the government is unable to bridge, and they are setting up domain-specific initiatives in the private training space, and they have been very successful. <coughs> we see that this uh, supply of tra training institutes by the government creates a price discovery problem. It's very difficult to know exactly what a student is willing to pay given that he has an alternative of going to a private, to a government skill training institute. And a government skill training institute, particularly in backward areas, may command 
greater uh, trust from the students since they would value a government certificate and since there is no accreditation mechanism that helps them distinguish across different private players. There is, however, significant market growth, particularly in the service sectors such as IT, telecom, media, entertainment. There is going to continue to be huge labor demand from the industry as well as the schools. There is a great deal of interest from the students in sectors such as retail and hospitality. So if we look at the Indian market, we are looking at a volume game. A successful skill development in initiative in India typically focuses on a high volume model. And this is due to multiple factors that are prevalent in the Indian market, such as competition and low acceptance of skill development as an alternative. So to build credibility, a, a very high priced uh, course is unlikely to find students who would be willing to invest in it. If we look at the scope for international players in this area, in terms of opportunities, there are a large number of opportunities. It is possible to develop institutes in India, since 100% FDI is permitted. Co-development of institutes with private partners is a model that has seen success, and it has been popular among international players. In terms of content, curriculum, and pedagogies, there are a lot of institutes that require support. Singapore is well known and well recognized for the quality of its skill training. And by providing content support, they would be bridging a gap that the Indian sector is currently facing. Training of trainers is another area that has received a lot of attention. The NSDC as well as state governments are looking at the problem of training the trainers very seriously. Because even when a uh, skill development institute is set up, even when curriculum is standardized, even when content is uniform across skill training institutes, there are there is a lot of variability in the quality. And this is because it's simply because of the delivery of training. The availability of quality trainers is a huge obstacle. It's one of the largest obstacles for any obstacles for any skill training institute in India at the moment. Uh, the government is looking at setting up world-class training institutes. The sector skill councils are mandated to promote centers of excellence. And setting up world-class training institutes is something that international players, particularly Singapore, could collaborate on given that they have a huge deal of expertise in this area. Certification, testing and accreditation mechanisms are just being built. This is a need that has been identified very recently and this is a space that's wide open. Partnerships with existing institutes or skill development missions are also gaining a great deal of popularity and traction, particularly because skill development missions in certain states are extremely proactive at the moment in order to bridge the skill gap. The main sectors that are likely to be of interest to international players and to Singapore given its competencies is the service sector, particularly sectors such as construction, healthcare, finance, logistics, maritime, retail and hospitality. In terms of the services that can be provided, innovative vocational education courses, particularly those that leverage technology, will be encouraged and will see a market in India. Partnering with state governments or skill development missions for setting up advanced training institutes is another option. Skill development missions in different states are setting up advanced training institutes which offer specialized courses for specific sectors and skills. In facilitating the setting up of these uh, institutes, particularly since public-private partnership options are being explored at the moment, international players have a huge opportunity. Faculty training institutes, as I mentioned earlier, is another great opportunity because of the unavailability of quality trainers. Certification of blue-collar workers for regional markets is a gap that India is facing, not only within the country, but even if for workers who go to other economies to work, who go to say Dubai or other places to work, their certification from any private skill training institute is often not recognized. A Singapore certificate is recognized. It's recognized in the entire Asian region. And Singapore has credibility in skill development. And this is a space that can be explored further. Soft skills training is expected to be one of the largest markets in the coming years, particularly because we have a lot of local level school, uh, we have a lo lot of local language schools. The medium of instruction tends to be the local language. But employ employment in the services sector often requires the knowledge of English. And soft skills training is an area that has seen phenomenal growth over the past few years. 
In terms of business models, we've seen government to government collaborations in the past as well, where the economy, the governments of two countries partner with each other in order to provide for greater collaboration to evolve standards for skill development and to create a, a conducive environment for skill development and partnerships between the two countries. Singapore and India have set, uh, have signed a memorandum of understanding to collaborate in the skill development area. In terms of government to industry, we see a great deal of interest in the public-private partnership sector. In states such as Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka and Madhya Pradesh, the skill development missions that have been set up by the state are extremely proactive. In Karnataka, the state government is working with GIZ to set up world-class training institutes that offer multi-skilling courses. In terms of industry to industry uh, partnerships, of course, we can have joint ventures and we can have knowledge partnerships where the Singapore investor or peer provides content support or knowledge support to the local partner in the department. Uh, we have worked in the skill development sector quite uh, across different types of clients. We have experience in opportunity ma mapping. We have conducted market research for various types of clients. We have undertaken deep policy analysis. We have undertaken feasibility studies for private players. And we've looked at exploring different business models that would be appropriate for each of them. We've worked with the National Skill Development Corporation on looking at, uh, uh, on conducting a district level skill gap assessment for the state of Tamil Nadu. So essentially, we're looking at what the demand and supply for skills is in each dis each of the 32 districts of Tamil Nadu, qualitatively as well as quantitatively. With the British High Commission, we've looked at what's a, what are the opportunities and challenges in the skill development space in India to, pro to uh, create a concept note that would serve as a point of reference for people who are interested in this sector. We've worked with the CII on conducting an impact study of the existing skill uh, in, uh, uh, industrial training institutes which are being upgraded on a public-private partnership basis. And we've also provided services like transaction advisory to private clients such as the Bank Bangalore Chamber of Industry and Commerce and the Aerospace Sector Skill Council. So in our experience and based on our interactions with various stakeholders across these projects, what we would recommend are the opportunities in this particular space are firstly in, for any skill development institute that is set up in India, partnership is very important. Understanding the local market is very important. <coughs> India is hugely complex in terms of socio-economic characteristics. And these cultural factors determine the success of a skill training institute. Something as small as location of one training institute vis-a-vis the other branch can cause a huge disparity in the sort of students who show an interest in that institute. And it becomes very difficult to target and mobilize students which is why we encourage partnership with local players who have an understanding of that market. In terms of sectors and skill levels, the focus should be on upskilling. For higher skill levels, there is ample supply. For formal uh, training institutes, there are, uh, for uh, formal education, there are a lot of universities. There are students who are interested in this area and they are going in to uh, acquire these skills, they are willing to invest in acquiring these skills, even abroad if they must, because the returns to such skilling is very different from the returns that we see to other vocational education programs. In service sectors, we have a major skill gap, particularly at the lower skill levels, that needs to be bridged. If we look at the enablers for this sector, we have training of trainers, which will be a huge skill gap that is an enabler for any international player interested in entering this market. Content pedagogy support is something which will be received positively because of Singapore's expertise in this sector. And pricing will make or break that institute. In terms of pricing, we recommend penetration pricing. In adopting a skimming strategy, it's very difficult